Welcome to this justice briefing on calculating corrections costs, the high stakes of probation and parole. I want to start by thanking Arnold Ventures for their support of the research and tools we'll be discussing today. We would like to hear from you. We may not have time for many questions, uh, but we do encourage everyone to use the chat box beneath the broadcast uh, to submit any questions you have, and we'll do our best to get to them. We'd love for everyone to engage on social media throughout the event using our event hashtag, Reentry Matters, and by following along with us on Twitter at CSGJC. Probation and parole are, having, are massive systems. There are 4.5 million people under supervision. And these systems have the ability to make or break a person's second chance. Working with corrections agencies across the states, the CSG Justice Center found that 45% of prison admissions are due to violations of probation or parole. Technical violations, such as missing appointments or failing drug tests, account for one in four of all state prison admissions. Regardless of the reason, the cost of these outcomes from our supervision system are enormous for taxpayers, over $9 billion annually. But the largest of these systems, probation, for example, perform as well or better by any measure of recidivism than sentencing a similar person to prison. And we've seen some states, including ones represented in our discussion here today, make considerable improvements in order to deliver better outcomes for people on supervision, bolster the safety of local communities and lower costs for taxpayers. So why does all this matter? Simply put, even when these big systems deliver better outcomes, they have a big impact on incarceration. If we care about public safety, if we care about the scale and cost of incarceration, we have to care about improving probation and parole. And caring about these systems means understanding their impact and potential. We're excited about a new tool we've developed with the support and input of state corrections agencies, as well as our partners at Recidivids, and how it can contribute to these discussions nationally and in states around the country. We call the tool a cost calculator. It helps estimate the impact on prison populations and costs from changes in supervision outcomes over time. In the past, we would often look to recidivism rates to measure success and outcomes in this area, but it's a lagging indicator and not clear how it impacts who is incarcerated and what that costs today. So we designed this calculator to help policymakers and the public see just how big an impact relatively small changes in revocation trends can create. Let's do a quick demo. You can find the calculator online at csgjusticecenter.org. First, select the state. We have data here uh, from over 46 states, and more data will be added uh, as, we, as we obtain it. Here we'll uh, model using Missouri as an example. Most of the data is from 2019, um, and we'll be adding data soon on revocations from 2020. Next, select an implementation window. How long over which do you want to phase in the change uh, the tool is estimating? And a time frame. How long, uh, how many years do you want to calculate uh, the impact for? Anywhere from one to five years out. Then start estimating changes. At zero, the tool tells you there were 14,344 people in prison for a supervision violation in 2019 in Missouri. They were there either for technical violations or new crimes. Because that distinction is a, is a tricky one to sort out and one that several states have trouble making, we didn't break that out here. To see more detail on your state's breakdown, you can head to our confined and costly report available on our website, which brings in much greater detail. So let's quickly walk through some examples. Say, for example, that your state adopted a goal to reduce revocations by 50% by 2025. Simply draw down the slider, and the cost calculator helps you see just how much achieving that goal would reduce your prison population and the significant savings it would help generate that could be reinvested. Now, conversely, suppose you are in or supervision 
might cause revocations to increase. Or in the current case of the pandemic, we know that revocations have been depressed by changes in reporting and court processing. We can use the tool to model a 20% increase in revocations to prison and calculate the additional population and cost that would generate. A couple of notes to be aware of when using the tool. We refer to revocations here, but you should know that we are including in the model any violation that results in the state prison admission. Second, the tool only models revocations and not other factors that impact prison populations. So the baseline here, which is the prison population in 2019, is there just to help illustrate the isolated impact of changes in revocations. It's only modeling the change in how many people are incarcerated for supervision violations, technical or new arrests. So while the prison population baseline is here from 2019, it, the, the change we think of is still useful to help calculate. Third, a word about costs. It's important to know the difference between marginal costs and fully loaded costs. And we use both here in the calculator to generate the cost uh, savings or uh, cost uh, uh, impact here in the tool. Here's how we do that. When the, pop the tool generates an impact of less than a thousand people, either more or less in prison, we use marginal costs, which are roughly $1,000 $1, per person per year. This accounts for changes in food or healthcare costs that really truly change more or less on the margin. We use fully loaded costs, which include staffing and savings or costs that might come from changes in, in units or uh, other larger decisions about uh, correctional populations once the number gets above 1,000. And we use the state's specific fully loaded costs, which generally range between 10, 20 and 30,000 per person per year to generate that. Also on costs, the tool is designed to underscore the relative impact of these changes, not to suggest that such a change can immediately free up savings or costs in an overall corrections budgets. Costs are calculated over the time frame selected. So a five year time frame is giving you a cumulative cost or savings over that multi-year period. You can always look at just a one-year impact and the resulting changes uh, if needed. We think this tool can be really helpful for a variety of people. The state policymaker looking to see how It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, it's interesting when people think about corrections, they think about prisons. And one of the things we know is that it's a full continuum. And so it's important for everyone to understand investing in probation and parole is as important as investing in our prison system. Uh, when we think about corrections, we're much more today than conditions of supervision imposed by the court or the parole boards. And so really it's about behavior modification. And I try to tell people that in corrections, we are the only position in the criminal justice system that at the time that we do. So it's really incumbent upon us to identify evidence-based programs, things that are shown to work, and then how we train our staff to implement these programs correctly, accurately, and that we're looking for the right behaviors to reward and incentivize in the people that we work with. Behavior change really occurs and sustains in the community, in people's natural environment. So that's where probation and parole is so effective at helping people become contributing citizens to their community. 
Thanks. Brooks, I want to turn to you. Can you speak to uh, why this issue is so important to the Reform Alliance? You're singularly focused on improving probation and parole. Can you speak to why why that is the Reform's focus and, and why it's so important? Absolutely, Marshall. Uh, good to see you again be on this panel. I want to uh, send a special shout out to my good friend, Senator Sims, who Senator Sims and Kwame Raoul and Jahan Gordon Booth in Illinois have been an amazing trio for justice reform in this work. So just excited to have him on this panel as well. You know, we're in the midst of a pandemic and have been through uh, racial justice uprising over the last summer. And we see real change and opportunity moving forward. You see, probation and parole is where big reform is possible. Um, and in part because there are so many, many people caught in the probation and parole system. There's 4.75 million people right now on probation and parole across this country. And we're not talking about people that are in prison. We're talking about people that are home that at any moment can see themselves go sit to jail or to prison facilities. And that's not a way to live life. That's not a way to be able to to be connected to family and community where you have to worry about what time you go to the grocery store, uh, whether or not you can go on vacation, county or stay over. Uh, we have entire uh, communities of, of folks that have to worry about these types of things and not helping them facilitate or reintegrate back into society. So, so we at Reform Alliance are concerned about this. Uh, Reform Alliance was born out of uh, the Meek Mill story where he was uh, basically riding uh, a motorcycle. Um, and riding the motorcycle, popping a wheelie, uh, resulted in him getting uh, sent uh, into, to, to, to see a judge. And uh, that, that process resulted in a two to four year sentence for Meek. And, and the Reform Alliance community, the board, uh, felt that it was important to not just tell the story of me, but also talk about the millions of people that are living their life in the same way that can't do basic things uh, that you and I and others uh, take for granted. So it, it's an important issue. Uh, we're committed to significantly reducing the number of people on probation and parole uh, and create real pathways to work, wealth, and well-being. Uh, we believe we're off to a good start, Reform Alliance and uh, my former organization, Alliance for Safety and Justice, worked closely together in California uh, to pass 1950, where we reduced probation sentences to two years. Um, we just recently uh, worked to, to put caps in the state of Virginia, and that bill is before the governor's desk expecting to sign it. We're working hard in the state of Pennsylvania uh, to put real, real caps. So, so this is an issue that is in our view, an issue of everyday people. Everyday people uh, should be given the opportunity to work, uh, to provide for their family, uh, not worried about whether or not their decision is gonna land them um, into a jail and turn into a prison. And so we're excited to be a partner with CSG and others in this effort. Senator Sims, I wanna to turn to you uh, and, and ask, what do you see as the key challenge to improving uh, people, uh, outcomes for people on probation or parole uh, from your seat in the legislature. Sure. Well, first, let me, let me say thank you uh, to CSG for having this very timely discussion. Uh, and to my colleagues who are, who are here on this panel, who are on the front lines, uh, you know, I, I, I got to pause also and, and send it back to the little love back to uh, my good friend Robert for the amazing work that he does, uh, but also to, to the director. Uh, you know what's what we what we find in the criminal justice system is that we have to really we are we we've gone through this these policies of uh, of, of the past and that focused on mass incarceration, uh, but now we need to reimagine what public safety looks like. And but through that through reimagining what public safety looks like, it's investing in those opportunities that will keep individuals from the criminal justice in the first place. However. If they are into the criminal justice system, I always talk about the fact that the Department of Corrections is supposed to correct behavior and make pursuant to our Constitution that after they have served their time, they return to their fullest usefulness. And that's what policy is supposed to be about. 
recently here in the state of Illinois, we passed a sweeping criminal justice reform bill uh, called the Safety Act. It focuses on safety in our communities, accountability for law enforcement, and fairness and equity in our criminal justice system today. And those those efforts really speak to what we are talking about here this morning and, and how we how we invest in one of the cornerstones of that plan as we invest, how we invest in changing communities uh, is one through, through one of the cornerstones of that plan, which is the elimination of the use of cash bail here in the state of Illinois. So it's, as it's forcing us and we in conjunction with uh, with the judiciary are looking to revamp and, and reimagine that that pretrial system but also to work for our parole and probation system. That's a, what we call here in Illinois, mandatory supervised release. So looking to modernize those, those systems because to keep those individuals that Robert talked about, uh, make them whole, make sure that they continue to uh, be able to have the quality of life that, we, that, that all of us enjoy. Uh, we wanna make sure that individuals who are threats to public safety, they are incapacitated, uh, but individuals who, are, who have who have, who, have, who have mental health or substance abuse challenges, we get them in appropriate treatment as opposed to ho simply housing them in our criminal justice, in our, in our correction system. This is, this is going to take all of us to, to be willing to be uncomfortable, with being comfortable with being uncomfortable, and stretching our imagination. The, the policies of the past are not, not, not where we can continue to go. We have to continue to move towards policies that will allow us to recognize that as a, as a society, we have to invest in individuals. We have to invest in growing and understanding the underlying challenges that people face, while while, while at the same time keeping our community safe. Uh, that's that is that's what's important. That's the goal. And as I'm, I'm proud to be a part of these efforts, and proud to make sure to work with uh, CSG and the Council of State Governments and Justice Center on on these issues because they are critically important that we establish these policies nationwide, so we have a, a better a better community for us all. Thank you, Senator. There are so many issues uh, being discussed and, and that states are making progress on uh, looking at and improving in our criminal justice system. You mentioned everything from pretrial uh, through people on, on community supervision uh, leaving prison. And I also want to lift up the, the, the point that two points you, you, you talked about that the need to scale these changes uh, nationwide, as well as that corrections can't do it alone. And Director Priest, like you mentioned, just how much the corrections field has changed and now has evidence-based practices to begin applying and implementing. Um, but uh, just changing evidence-based practices in, in corrections or even state policy alone is unlikely to really generate the kind of public safety and success that individuals and communities uh, are looking for. I want to turn to Director Tewalt. I know uh, you mentioned in, in past conversations we've had just that we, we can't be using revocations solely as our measure of success here. We need to be looking more holistically. Can you talk a bit about how you view that as a director of corrections and, and, and why this isn't, isn't just a matter of, of measuring and, and tracking revocations. Uh, we have to think more differently. Uh, absolutely, and, and I think it, it really starts with how we look at public safety to begin with. I mean, the, the notion that our communities are safer based on how quickly we can apprehend somebody who does wrong, I think is just, tell such an incomplete story you know our communities are safer when the people who would otherwise be involved in our system are able to be successful and are able to contribute and are are, are able to to function uh free of crime and and that's i think it starts there it starts with how we define public safety and and putting that emphasis on success because as noted by everybody who talked before it, it's such a unique challenge and and to senator sims point of understanding issues i i think that's where that's where we're trying to focus our efforts on uh, you get out of the business of lowest common denominator corrections and simply responding to the behavior that somebody exhibits uh, and, and digging deeper and trying to understand why, because we may encounter a lot of uh, our population that has substance use disorder or behavioral health concerns. But if, if we're simply responding to that, we're ignoring all the other factors that we know uh, are really important to helping people be successful and productive in our communities, whether we're addressing insecurity in housing or financial insecurity or, or unemployment, all those other aspects. Uh, we've, for, 
far too long we've beaten our head against the wall saying we just can't get this person to engage in treatment or we're just not able to get them to make good decisions without acknowledging that it's tough to make good decisions when you're trying to figure out where you're going to sleep that night or where your next meal's coming from you know from from our perspective in idaho and, and i know it's echoed uh from a lot of my peers across the country the the importance that we place not just on the accountability that certainly is always going to be a part of what we do, but being willing to match that with interventions that we know are going to put people on a better path towards success. Thanks, Director. I want to turn back to Director Presythe. Um, you've had success in Missouri. I, I know I was showing your numbers in the cost calculator. I hope that's okay. Um, uh, but, you know, certainly revocations are a big driver uh, and have been a big driver of admissions. Uh, to prison in, in Missouri, but I know you've, you've been making significant progress in reducing those numbers. Can you talk about one or two things that, that have been showing signs of success um, as you look to, to tackle this issue in Missouri? Thank you. So, um, yes, I'm good with you using Missouri data to show on the cost calculator. We are proud of some of the progress that we are making. We have implemented a new validated risk instrument uh, among all of our field staff and within our prisons. And it's really starting to help officers understand who they're focusing their attention on. And then how do we get more services to those particular individuals? We've revamped some of our community supervision centers to be much more structured in programming. And we're seeing better outcomes from the people who have participated in those programs and they're remaining violation free when they come out and they're not returning to prison. And so that's that's the kind of outcome that you're looking for. That's what shows that people are getting the resources that they need in that intense time frame that's really starting to make a difference. Because at the end of the day, we want people to be successful in their community. And we've got to employ the efforts that can help them understand how to look at things differently, how to make better decisions, and ultimately remain out of the criminal justice system. So I'm very excited about what's happening. Anecdotally, we have a lot of information from our staff, but because the tools that we're using are still relatively new, we don't have a lot of concrete data at this particular point, but I'm excited to see a year from now what our data looks like. Thanks, Director. So lots of practices being used. You mentioned risk assessment, um, but uh, I know one of the key goals uh, for, for many states is to really use that and other mechanisms to really focus uh, at the, the people that are really uh, under the, the kind of control or, or guise of, guise of the of supervision officers, really try to, to both lower caseloads and allow officers to work more than just five to 10 minutes once a month, but really work with an individual to address, help address their needs, connect them to resources and, and hold them accountable in, in meaningful ways. So you, you mentioned risk assessment is certainly one vehicle. I know Missouri also has a, a legislative policy to, to provide uh, earn time to people on supervision if they're um, meeting conditions, they can earn time off of their supervision period. I know that's a policy other states are looking at, but I wanna to turn to Senator Sims. Um, because I believe you mentioned um, policies related to mandatory supervised release um, post-prison supervision and some changes you made there, I believe, to, to the length of, of time people spend. Can you talk about some of the, the rationale and the, and, and the arguments used in, in helping make that new policy in Illinois? I'm gonna jump in, Senator. I hate hate to interrupt. I believe your mic is off. We couldn't couldn't hear you. Oh, oh sure. sorry. It was a really profound statement. I I saw these great things. Um, 
uh, so no, it, it was uh, as I as I was as I was saying or trying to say, um, the, the policies that we put into place really were to encourage and incentivize uh, individuals to uh, engage in in programmatic offerings within the Department of Corrections to talk about being able to correct that behavior, uh, giving them the opportunities to be successful so they would not recidivate when they leave the department, uh, but not just to avail themselves of the opportunities, but to really immerse themselves in those opportunities and make them uh, and, and make sure that that they are giving them giving themselves to uh, the, avail the opportunities that, to address issues they might have or educational opportunities or or uh, activities or opportunities available to them. So really giving uh, individuals the opportunities and the tools to be successful when they left the Department of Corrections, so they would not return. And that's uh, that, so that was that's that was our plan. And our and, and as we included those changes into the Safety Act to really give individuals uh, the opportunity who who are who are going to return to communities because the vast majority of individuals who sit in correctional facilities across this country are going to return to the communities where they where they came from. Um, so we want to make sure when they when they, they've got the skills to, and the tools necessary to be successful upon their return. Um, so that was that was the effort and the thought process behind changes we have made to sentencing credits uh, here and in in included in the recently passed Safety Act, uh, so that we give give individuals those opportunities to really be successful. Thanks so much, Senator. I want to turn to, to Robert Rooks. Um, you know, reform is, and your work, uh, you, you and your colleagues, uh, is looking at reform efforts and policy changes around probation pro across the country. Um, can you talk about um, you know, the, the reasons that Senator Sims just gave for why policymakers are taking up these issues? But I want, I'm curious if you could talk about some of the other mechanisms um, that states are using to, to shorten or, or focus supervision terms and how you know, the cost of, of failure and outcomes from probation parole factor into some of the, the arguments you're making with policymakers. Yeah, Marsha, absolutely. I just wanted to take a step back and just speak to um, the origins of probation, right? The origins of probation were to get people back reconnected to family, reconnected to their lives, reconnected to work. Uh, that's really what we're talking about. I know when reform goes into a state, a couple of things we're looking at one, what is the length of probation terms, parole terms in that state? Uh, we, we believe anything over 18 months or two years uh, should be looked at. Uh, we also want to encourage expanding diversion programs in state. So fewer people go into formal probation um, in the first place. And then, as you mentioned in Missouri, we're really excited about the idea of expanding alternative response to technical violations. So few people get reincarcerated. The idea of an earned credit system um, to replace technical violations is super exciting to us. Uh, giving people an opportunity to uh, work off their time. Um, it's incentive based, not uh, punitive based. And we think that's really exciting and important. Work. We want states to look in that direction um, as well. There are other things, though, uh, that really speaks to the moment in time we're in. Uh, we believe that uh, when governments have uh, people, when they are engaging with people, they should be helping people. And that's not what's happening. In fact, probation stipulations undermine people's ability to work and get employment. And we would love for states to take a look at uh, things that they can do to limit uh, the barrier for employment opportunities um, in states. We believe this is really important um, and it's part of uh, probation's original purpose of connecting people uh, to health and, and well-being. Um, we also look, need to look at the science um, and understand that recovery uh, is a process um, that's not about, you know, whether or not you, um, you know, fall back into addiction and therefore you should go to jail or prison. Um, it's about bringing in the science, uh, looking at recovery and, 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 and looking at uh, how to get people plugged into uh, places of help and care. Uh, and so th that's some of the kind of ideas that we have 
we bring when we go into into states. Uh, we think it's really Im Im important uh, to also uh, bring accountability um, as well. Um, excited about those states that are talking about restorative justice principles, uh, bringing victims and people that harm them closer together um, as nation, um, and uh, having people work through um, real challenges, real problems. And once done, uh, you know, people can work off their time um, on probation. Uh, we think that overall community investment is important, investing in the lives of people. Uh, so we're excited about the conversation that's happening in states. Thanks, Robert. I want to turn to Director T. Walt. Um, you know, I know in Idaho, uh, revocations or violations um, from probation and parole, which uh, the state do oversee probation and parole in addition to uh, Department, Department of Corrections. And seeing back, you know, five, 10 years, uh, uh, directors focus really what's on, on institutions um, and not supervision. And, and I'm curious how you know, recognize the, the huge role that revocations play in, in just who's coming in and out of, of the facilities in Idaho. How do you, how is your, the role as you see it uh, as a director shifted to really focus, you know, as much um, or more on, uh, on supervision and outcomes uh, from probation and parole? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think it's important to note that we've, you know, in Idaho, you look at, at who constitutes the new commitments to our correctional system and 75% and of them, three out of four, are people that either failed supervision or failed uh, another diversionary opportunity. So, you know, one of the first things that, that we had to do was just stop pretending like we don't have any say and who comes to us or when they leave. Uh, you know, we may not be decision makers when it comes to sentencing. We may not be decision makers when it comes to releasing, but we we surely influence the people who do make those decisions based on the level of confidence we can instill in our ability to help people be successful in our communities. And, and so that first and foremost is just acknowledging it. And and what what I think is interesting is when you know those numbers are alarming. Uh, but they're also not new. That's been the story of Idaho's correctional system for decades. And so when, when we start looking at how then can we influence that, how can we influence our prison population, um, it, clearly you look to the community for answers. There. And, and then when we dig a little deeper, we come to better understand that 88% uh, of the people who do uh, have their supervision revoked It's a barometer. It's a it, it very clearly is the place where we need to be focusing our resources and and helping helping our policymakers understand what's really going to make a difference. Because one of the other challenges we have is is simply acceptance of the way things have always been. And and I think helping helping our our policymakers at the legislature, our appropriators, understand that through policy and practice, uh, you know we've we've funded failure for a long time, which is the most expensive thing that we do, but investing and in, in looking at, at ways we can help people be successful while on supervision or keep them off of supervision and from becoming intertwined with our justice system simply to avail themselves of resources that we all agree they need. I, I think helping them understand how those investments can pay off has been, uh, been pretty critical for us here in Idaho. Numbers, Director, you just mentioned in terms of the share of admissions that come from uh, supervision are, are just are staggering. And and I think one of the, the things that we've hoped the, the cost calculator and, and our earlier work gathering up data from your department and others around the country is really highlighting how much of a hidden driver of prison populations and prison missions that this is. You know, we typically think about sentencing. Uh, issues when we think about what really drives the, the front door of, uh, of a prison system. And as you mentioned, uh, you know, this has been the case for a while, but it's not been one that, that's really been recognized um, as such. And that how much agency states and <clears throat> policymakers and corrections leaders really have to, to try to take steps to, to improve outcomes that really would uh, control and help manage um, costs and, and prison populations. Director Priestley, I'm, I'm curious, as you look at the cost calculator tool and, and think about 
you know, some of your conversations with policymakers and, and, and trying to create this dynamic that we're talking about. I think all of us on this call are really familiar with it. Um, but it, it's it, it's a dynamic that's not common sense. It's not kind of publicly understood. And so I'm curious, how, how do you see this tool being helpful in, in, in some of your conversations? I think, I think your mic is off. Sorry. When I think about using a cost calculator, I always remind myself, I've grown up in this business. I understand it. I understand the consequences of not doing better in the community. When we talk to legislators, especially new legislators who come from varied backgrounds in their communities, corrections is not a widely understood business at all. And I don't think as a whole, the general public understands just how expensive the business of corrections is. So using the cost calculator is a really simple visual tool that helps start the conversation about why it's important to invest in the community side of things. It's very simple to explain that if we reduce revocations, which reduces prison population and increases savings, and now you can show that versus if we cut programs and increase revocations, which increases our prison population and decreases, excuse me, it increases our population, that's going to decrease our savings. So it's really important. And I think it's an aha moment for a lot of people that don't normally think about really the impact of funding community programs. So I'm excited about it. It shows both ends of the impact of what happens if we improve, what happens if we stay the same, what happens if we go the opposite direction. And I think it gives real credibility to all of the reforms that we know in the long run are important for public safety, for our communities, for the people that we serve. So I'm excited about it. I, I enjoy taking it to the legislature. It really helps to start a good conversation about what good looks like. Thanks so much. Rob. Director Robert, I want to turn to you. You know, as you work with advocates at the state level and nationally, is, is this a tool that you uh, see being useful um, in, in lifting up the fiscal impact of these issues? Oh, absolutely. The tool is great. Um, I uh, really enjoyed uh, the story um, that, the, that the tool is telling regarding waste and cost. There are two things come to mind in terms of immediate uh, ways we can use it. One, states and, and local governments are struggling. Uh, right now, there, there are budget shortfalls all across the country and uh, engaging in conversations regarding how we can save states uh, dollars uh, can be huge um, for reform opportunities. So the, the tool offers that up clearly and directly. So I'm super excited about that. Um, the second thing is I'm hoping that the tool is really an on-ramp. Um, for talking about uh, the human cost of dysfunction, uh, the human cost of having probation and parole systems that are broken, um, that are not working, uh, a way to uh, color the data with stories of people, everyday folks uh, that feel that probation and parole is a trap for them. I think the data can show that, uh, that talk about the contradictory rules uh, that currently exist in these probation and parole systems, some of what I talked about uh, earlier, um, how just uh, going to uh, the grocery store can result in someone uh, being revoked. Uh, we also believe that uh, the tool can be helpful in making the case for how uh, state government should be spending their time. I think a lot more uh, state government should be working on pathways to work, uh, pathways to support, um, and getting people reconnected to family. I think the tool can do that. Um, so super excited about uh, using it wherever we go. Uh, and kudos, congrats to, to you, Marshall, and your team. 
and the folks at Recidivist for, for pulling it together. Thanks, Robert. As, as, as you mentioned, um, there's so many aspects to this issue, but lifting up uh, the fiscal impact and the small changes in huge impacts in terms of prison populations and, and cost savings or, or costs to taxpayers. Um, highlights both the, the potential for these systems to, to improve and improve public safety, improve lives, um, as well as, as the, the challenge of scaling the, these kinds of better, better practices, both in policy and practice and, and community supports nationwide across, uh, across all these agencies. Um, all of you are working tirelessly, um, agencies, legislators, advocates, uh, to, to spur those, accelerate those reforms and changes. Um, thank you all uh, to the panelists for, for joining uh, this conversation and for more importantly, for the work you do uh, in your states and nationally. We really hope you'll take the time so much. to see what's possible in, in your state uh, by using the cost calculator yourself. Uh, you can find uh, the tool available at csgjusticecenter.org. We'll also be sharing an email from this event with links to all the publications and tools we discussed today. I want to thank Arnold Ventures again for their support. And uh, we'd love to hear your feedback on this event. I invite you to fill out a short survey. You'll see a button underneath the broadcast on your screen where you can do just that. Thank you all so very much for, for joining us.